This is an episode of Reasonably Sound Classic. For the first 30-some episodes, this podcast was distributed by Infinite Guest, American Public Media's podcast network. Thus, it benefited from blanket broadcast licenses held with every music publisher. After going independent, pretty much all intro, outro, and interstitial music had to be removed. The intro and outro music you're going to hear is an in-progress version of Reasonably Sound's theme, written by Will Stratton. The awkward silences are where act break music used to be, so if you could just imagine like Queen or the Misfits or Kate Bush along the way, that would be great. If you want to support Reasonably Sound in the hopes that maybe one day I'll be able to afford some blanket licenses of my own, you can check out the Patreon at patreon.com forward slash reasonably sound. Okay, on with the show. summer in New York, and that means a bunch of things. Dudes in mesh tank tops, many wonderful fragrances amplified by the summer sun, humidity like a terrarium inside of a greenhouse, inside of someone's actual armpit, and the guarantee that no matter where you are in the city, no matter the time of day, from East New York to Chelsea Piers, you can hear the Mr. Softy jingle. I'm going to be perfectly honest here. I hate Mr. Softy trucks because of their jingle. I often fantasize, and, and this is completely honest, about creating some kind of impossible device which I could point at or attach to a Mr. Softy truck in order to neutralize that awful racket and also so that these kids will get off my damn lawn. It wasn't always like this, I promise. I do love ice cream trucks generally, or maybe I loved them. Maybe the love affair is over now, thanks to Mr. Softy. I grew up going to ice cream trucks. I went to one specific ice cream truck regularly. It was owned by my grandparents' neighbor, Mr. Condren, whose first name I think was... Joe, he had this big, ugly, brown ice cream truck that he would drive to the beaches during the summer, but when he wasn't driving around, he would park it in his driveway, and the neighborhood kids would just ring his doorbell, and he would come out, he would open the truck for us. He didn't work for a fleet, it was his truck, which also meant that he got to stock it with whatever he liked, including toys, novelty keychains, which, you know, is a big deal when you're like six, those mass-produced magic tricks, and comic books. It was out of the side of Mr. Condren's huge, brown, ugly truck that I bought my first comic book. I don't think his truck played a jingle. I'm going to choose to believe that his truck didn't play a jingle. Anyway, growing up, going to that truck or the various other trucks that would show up at the beaches of Cape Cod in Massachusetts, which they were mostly Mr. Cool trucks, uh, of course I would get excited. Ice cream on wheels. But the Mr. Softy truck in New York, at least, is a very different beast. They are not the bright, shiny, clean, and well-maintained harbingers of a cool refreshment and summertime fun that they are in other parts of the Northeast. They are dingy, jalopy-esque, traffic-inducing nightmares on wheels. They spew exhaust, engines rumbling like an overtaxed lawnmower, and they maneuver the city streets not unlike a drunken snail. Which is to say, I will admit being biased. Also, in my apartment, I have a home studio for making things like reasonably sound and recording music, and the number of times that I have had to stop to wait for the Mr. Softy guy to pass has been innumerable. Of course, that's partly my fault, recording in a place with such thin walls that the Mr. Softy jingle cuts right through, but that's how it's designed. You're supposed to be able to hear that song from your apartment with the windows closed and the air conditioning on. How else would you know that slightly melted ice cream of questionable cleanliness is parked out in front of your door? Okay, I'm sure they're very nice people. I'm sure the trucks are fine. It's just, it's like a personal thing. <sighs> 
And speaking actually of parking just outside your door, it is illegal in New York City for ice cream trucks to play their jingle while they are parked, which they do anyway. You can report them, but I've never done it. I haven't stooped that low yet. Okay, thank you for letting me get that off my chest. Now that I have complained for a solid couple minutes, let's talk about the one true song of summer, the ice cream truck jingle. But to set this up, we're going to tackle each of those things individually in order. Ice cream, then trucks, then their jingles. So iced treat like refreshment has been around for a long time, but it hasn't always been ice cream. Food items like flavored ice, which is exactly what it sounds like, sort of like an Italian ice before Italian ice, it dates back to, like, 1550. Earlier, if you count those times that Nero sent servants up a mountain to gather ice and transport it back packed in hay so that it wouldn't melt and he could smush it together with some berries and honey, I'm not kidding, that's a thing that happened, sent people up a mountain for ice. Ice cream as we know it, as opposed to flakes of frozen water flavored with whatever was lying around, has been around in some form since about the early 1700s in Italy, France, and England. In that order. One could also argue that a very old Chinese recipe for a kind of fermented dessert involving frozen milk and rice was an early ice cream analog, but according to Laura B. Weiss in her book Ice Cream, Italian cook Antonio Latini's milk sorbet from the 1650s is widely considered the first recipe approaching something we'd identify as ice cream. It took a while for Latini's recipe to transition from actual obscurity to relative obscurity and then longer from relative obscurity to, oh yeah, I've heard about that. For about the next hundred years, ice cream was enjoyed by the upper crust only. Besides the fact that all the required ingredients, especially sugar, were incredibly expensive and difficult to come by, its preparation was made difficult slash impossible in the absence of refrigeration. It wouldn't be until widespread existence of a middle class and a wide availability of certain food items and cold storage technology that ice cream would become a treat of the people. The history of ice cream is also the history of open trade routes, electricity, and manufacturing technology. The arrival of ice cream to America is shrouded in a bit of mystery. I've read claims that it was the Quakers who brought it over, and other claims that it was the Italians. One claim that it was the Polish. Either way, Americans, meaning people living in America after they'd emigrated from Europe, made two big and important contributions to the history of ice cream. We turned it from a creative, culinary marvel to be savored into a manufactured good, and we figured out how to sell the crap out of it. Hashtag America. By the mid-19th century, several mechanical ice cream makers had been invented and patented. There were a few companies in the business of mass-producing, at least as mass as one might get in the 1850s, ice cream. This, in combination with a class of people interested in and capable of purchasing the treat, finally signaled the long transition from bougie snack to everyman treat. Around the same time, in cities on the east coast of the U.S. and in the U.K., an immigration boom resulted in a tight job market. So lots of out-of-work men took to the streets selling whatever thing they happened to have an expertise in, and as it turned out... Many of them had an expertise in ice cream. Called hokey pokey vendors, these men sold a kind of water ice cream concoction, and again, according to Weiss, they were a common sight in urban America. This is the first recorded incidence of ice cream going mobile, but it wasn't until pharmacy soda fountains started serving ice cream with fizzy water around the end of the 19th century that ice cream really completed its transition to popular culture. 
So, I mean, if you took an American history class, you can probably conjure the image of a soda fountain. Long counter, stools, jerk with a hat, soda water, ice cream, syrup, and all of these huge ornate machines for injecting CO2 into water and whatever else happened to be around. It was an event, a place to go. Soda fountains were decked out, they were destinations, and when Prohibition shut down all the bars, soda fountains filled in part of the where-do-we-socialize vacuum. Momentarily, Anheuser-Busch even switched from brewing Budweiser to making ice cream. We're going to hold on soda fountains for now because they didn't drive around or have bells on them, but they did have their own sonic contribution to the ice cream scene, which we're going to get back to later. In the 1920s, Harry B. Burt Jr. was inspired by Christian Nelson, the inventor of the Eskimo pie, to make his own ice cream treat with one important addition, a stick. His invention, the Good Humor Bar, was patented in 1923 when he drove a sample of five boxes to the patent office to demonstrate that it was in fact different from the Eskimo pie, and by 1930, inspired maybe by the Hokey Pokey men, it was in trucks, on the streets, and getting into the hands of kids in the rapidly growing American suburbs. At the time, refrigeration technology was new, but Bert managed to retrofit a dozen garden variety street vending trucks with freezers and also with bells. From, quote, Harry Jr.'s bobsled, claims Nick Sukas at Unilever, the current owner of the Good Humor brand. So people sitting in their homes doing whatever not internet thing people did in their homes in the 1930s were alerted by the bells to the presence of the good humor man, a crisply dressed gent synonymous with good, clean, respectable American consumerism in the midst of the Great Depression. And this is important for just dozens of reasons. There is so much going on here. It's a little tough to know where to begin. So it's the Depression. And this guy thinks to put ice cream on cars as the road system continues to grow and stretch across America and connect previously unconnected or inconveniently connected towns and neighborhoods. In the trucks with the ice cream, he puts men who go through a rigorous training program to learn how to be a good humor man, respectful, courteous, crisp, clean, they tip their hat to ladies, they salute gentlemen, and will be fired if, while announcing their product, they intone good humor ice cream instead of the correct and reversed ice cream, good humor, which Bert named the company because in his eyes a person's overall humor was very much connected to their palate. So these crisp dudes selling ice cream good humor are driving their retrofitted, weirdly state-of-the-art ice cream trucks through a novel American countryside, peddling refreshment and diversion in more ways than one, at least five at my count, and they signal their presence with the bells taken off Harry Jr.'s own childhood bobsled. Bells, it's probably worth noting, at least in passing, being the light, tinkly sonification most often cinematically associated with you got it, cold. A chilly, nostalgia-summoning commercial distraction in a time of great economic woe ushered by, eventually, an army of highly trained, pleasant men in a newly mobile and connected America signaled by... In a paper for the Oxford Handbook of Mobile Music Studies, Volume 2, Daniel T. Neely makes a case that this collusion of characteristics sets the stage for the sounds made by ice cream trucks up through the current moment, like today, right now. In his paper, Ding Ding, The Commodity Aesthetic of Ice Cream Truck Music, Neely credits anamnesis with the reasoning and varied effectiveness of the music played by ice cream trucks. Anamnesis, by the way, and I, I had to look this up, is, quote, recollection. In particular, the remembering of things from a supposed previous existence. This is distinct from nostalgia in that nostalgia is about wanting to go back to a place that is impossible to return, whereas anamnesis, it seems, is pure recollection, familiarity. Familiarity, though, as Neely Weiss and some other ice cream scholars I read point out, plays a big part throughout many decisions made in the ice cream industry. 
After Bert launched his fleet of good humor men, other intrepid ice cream business people caught on and realized this was a great way to capitalize, literally, on the public's desire for at-their-door snack time, and the good humor bell as both a bit of curiosity and a piece of recognizable branding was too good a trope to abandon. The question became, though, what, if not bells, because that was already taken, would newly minted frozen dessert delivery fleets outfit themselves with? The answer, as it turned out, was blowing in the wind, which incidentally also happened to smell a lot like a soda fountain. Soda fountains, being the epicenters of social revelry that they were, employed no shortage of money-making schemes to keep the kids present, entertained, buying sodas. Other than ornate decoration and, of course, ice cream, one of the most common features of a good soda fountain was its music box a pay-for-play contraption capable of mechanically rendering a small selection of well-known tunes. This wasn't a jukebox, but rather a large disc or drum or sheet-driven, quote, automata, as Neely calls them, which could play back a limited selection of very specific pieces of music in not exceptionally complex detail, but regardless, they were popular. And their sound, also metallic, tinkling, like the bells, became synonymous with the experience of consuming ice cream. Neely writes, quote, an association between the sound of music boxes, the visuality of soda fountains, and the taste of ice cream had already been forged in ice cream parlors and soda fountains, end quote. Competitors in the burgeoning mobile ice cream business, now tasked with determining what sound source would alert potential customers to their presence, fell back on what they knew. And so a small list of industrious inventors, engineers, and ice cream men contributed to the introduction of actual music, as opposed to tinkling bells, to the sale of ice cream on the streets. In the 30s, Paul Hawkins, a good humor man in California, had West Coast Organ build him a mechanical music box. In the 1940s, John Ralston, also in California, hacked together a cylinder player out of toy parts and a microphone, and from there worked with several other people and organizations towards creating mass-produced music boxes for ice cream trucks. The most well-known and widely used ice cream music box is the Digital 2, constructed by Nichols Electronics, owned and operated by Mr. Bob Nichols. Nichols worked with Ralston and his ilk on the older cylinder-based systems, but in 1985, says Neely, started making boxes which imitated the tinny, chimey sound of those systems digitally. That system, which you can buy today, as a civilian, if you wanted to, still in production, having been altered almost not at all. There's even a website, NicholsElectronicsCo.com, where you can listen to the exact sounds produced by the machine. Here's a few. The Digital 2 plays eight of the, quote, most requested songs. The Entertainer, Little Brown Jug, Sailing Sailing, Camp Town Races, Red Wing, Brahms Lullaby, La Cucaracha, and Turkey in the Straw, which you've definitely heard a million times. It sounds like this. Of course, all of these songs have long, varied, and complex histories, but a couple years ago it was Turkey in the Straw that got particular attention when NPR ran a story by Theodore R. Johnson about its history, which he says is, quote, virulently racist. 
so racist. In fact, I am not at all comfortable getting into the details on Reasonably Sound. So I'm going to throw a link to the NPR piece and a counter argument piece written for the New Republic over on infiniteguest.org forward slash reasonably hyphen sound. Now, the jingle that I know the best is, as mentioned before, the Mr. Softy jingle. Though there are many jingles which come and go up and down the block throughout the whole summer, Mr. Softy is everywhere and was actually one of the original competitors for Bert and his good humor men. Founded in 1950 and headquartered in Philly, William and James Conway worked for no shortage of time trying to find out how to get a soft serve machine inside of a truck. By 1958, they were crushing it, or I guess pumping it, or serving it. I don't know, what's the correct verb to describe what a soft serve machine does? Extruding it. Ugh, gross. Anyways, as part of their early success, Mr. Softy Incorporated scored themselves a radio advertisement. They had gray advertising pen them a jingle. It was simple or catchy or irritating, or all three, enough that they decided to put it in music boxes, in their trucks, in 1960, and they haven't stopped since. Ever. Not for one moment of silence. Except for winters, I guess. My name is Mike Rignetta. And this podcast has been Reasonably Sound. You can find Reasonably Sound on Twitter and Instagram at Reasonably S-N-D. And you can find me, Mike Rugnetta, on Twitter, Tumblr, and Instagram at Mike Rugnetta. <laughs>